Hi, I'm Anthony Otahuis, and this is the video manual for the Spock Blender add-on. Spock is a procedural generation utility that will take co collections and instance the objects in them in order to pack them into a face. And we have a lot of techniques to use that simple concept in order to do some interesting things. So here I've got a sample object to work with. Now you can use any collection you want, but we're going to use a D-Pack that is included with the add-on. It's just called the Spock Sci-Fi D-Pack. It'll be here. Uh, you might have to expand it to see it. And it's a good one to work with when you're first getting used to it. You hit load to scene, and you can see it pulls in all of these collections. And each of those collections has several objects in it. And some of them are specially designed just to work with this kind of procedural generation tool. Next, you can choose your algorithm. The algorithm is going to decide how to take those instances and fill a space. You can start with random or max is a good one to get a feel for the application. We're going to go ahead and get that out of the way. Next, we're going to pick one of our collections. I'm just going to pick panels. And we're going to leave all these settings alone for now, and we will discuss those later in the details. Pick a face and hit pack. And that's pretty much it. You can continue picking a face and hitting pack. Then you can save them so that they're not, they don't disappear or clear or just hit, keep hitting pack if you want different results. When you like, have one you like, hit save and it's no longer going to clear out when you keep working. Now you can add more collections and they will start mixing in. So I have panels already. I'm gonna do pipes. Let me go ahead and get rid of saved sets. Now that I've got two selected, I'm just gonna hit pack and you can see they're mixed together. And that's pretty much it for the quick start. That will get you started in playing around with different collections, what they look like, if what settings you might need for them. Once you've done that, you can come back and get into the details of how to, how to get the most out of the tool. D-packs and how to create them are split into a separate video. If you want to find that in the description, or I should also have it listed pretty, pretty near the time frame that this video was published. Next is the algorithm, and I'll give you a little more detail on the algorithms. These first four are trying to fill a space with bounding boxes according to different algorithms. And I gave you an example of each one and kind of how they're going to look, what order they're going to fill with. And they're fairly similar. There's not a whole lot of difference between them, except for how they progress, whether it's like from one side filling in or from a corner. Those differences are kind of interesting or you can take advantage of those. Then we've got the columns, which is one of the laziest ways to try to fill the area. Even faster are these sort ones. So it's going to sort each of them by area or by shortest side or ratio of the width and height of an object and use that those dimensions in order to decide how to best uh, put everything in there or fill the face. You know, you're really going to need to play around with each one in order to get a feel for what they're go good for, or you can hit random and it's going to randomly choose one for you. Let's get into the settings for these collections. So when you choose a collection, you're presented with these details here. We've got the factor and the factor requires two to understand. With the pipes and panels, both selected and both having a factor of one, we should get approximately a 50-50 mix of the pipes to panels. It's not going to try and make it exactly 50-50. It's going to do it based on picking the objects. It has nothing to do with their surface area. But if you wanted one to dominate the other, let's say we want to have twice as many pipe objects as panels, maybe to balance out the surface area, then you could set a two to one factor. And let's say you want them to completely dominate. You can do a 10 to one. Although at this point, maybe you should be doing a hero for the panels instead of setting them at a one to 10 factor. But that's what, how you use the factor number. This is going to change if it is the hero type. And a hero type is, is set up so that you can just pick one individually. I'm gonna go ahead and set that back to instances. I'm just gonna add a new one for a hero. And we'll pick displays and we'll just tell it we want two. And we've got a couple there. So if you want to count how many that are going to be there, maximum, then you can use a hero. 
Otherwise, you're going to use instances and the factors to tell, you, tell it how many you want within a mix on the same surface. But all of these are working together on the same surface. If I instead choose one of them to be a fill type, say fill, and you'll notice that the factor goes away for a fill because it doesn't play into the factor at all. It's going to fill the entire surface on its own, and then everything else is going to just uh, is going to go right on top of it. So we'll hit pack. You might not be able to see it because everything's covering it, but we've got the pipes filling the entire surface underneath. You could do as many fills as you want as well. It's going to increase your instance count and some of them are going to be hidden. That can be an interesting thing to do to create that layered effect or have things in the crack. Speaking of having some cracks, I've got these panels in there just stuck right up against each other and it can be difficult to see things behind it when I have a layer that I want to see. So if we set 10% margin, it's going to do this based on the size of that object. It's That's where the 10% comes from. So each object is going to have a little different margin based on how big it is. Hit pack again and you can see that they're not stuck together anymore and you're able to see more things through them. So this could be useful for having uh, having layers below that you do want to show through. Next we've got the Z offset. So this is how far off of the surface according to the face normal it's going to sit. So everything's at a zero Z at the moment and some objects have these stands in order to manually create them off the surface but ones that don't have those stands and you want them to be off the surface and we'll just play with them. Let's do thin and let's see where these show up. Now this brings up an interesting thing where we can actually turn off as many settings as we want, isolate things down to one that we're working with. And with nothing else selected, these thin ones are going to show up, uh, are gonna have a lot of instances, especially with as small as they are. And you can see they just kind of fill in the surface horizontally and they're right on the surface. I'm going to show them coming off of the surface a little bit just for the purposes of this demonstration. And you can see that they now have that Z offset. So sometimes that's going to be useful for you. All right, next up we've got rotation. First, let's see what we've got with no rotation. Okay, and you can see the panels all face the same direction. And maybe that works out for you, but maybe like on the displays, let me go ahead and do a pack showing that. On the displays, the displays have a specific orientation that they need in order to look correct. And for this face, it's going to be a 180. So you can do a consistent rotation for the displays, you know, keep them how they're supposed to be. But you can also do some random rotation. So I can take these panels and the thin elements, give them some random rotation, and it'll just give us some variation even though we have the same objects, they're not gonna look as repetitive. Yeah. So you can see here, these ones are flipped opposite of each other. These are square-ish, so they can have different orientations. All right, so we've got, that covers rotation. Next, we've got scale. And we could do this, especially with these panels. The scale can either be constant, we will set this to 0.5, so half scale or they can uh, have some randomization. And for the randomization, we're gonna unlock it and we will set its max. So we have now have a min and the max and it's gonna pick a random point in between. And now we've got some variation in scale, big and small for those objects. Whether or not this works with your D-Pack, it, it all depends on what you're going for. And that pretty much covers all of the settings within a collection set. We went over instances and heroes. Another good one to talk about is empties. When I talk about empties, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of a few of these and just come back to the panels. Pack it so that you can see what we're working with. I'm even going to get rid of the margin completely. And let's leave them all at the half size. So min and max are both half size. Right. Um, let's even remove the rotation just so you see them packed in pretty tight, right? Pretty solid surface there. Instead of just margins for the spacing, I might want some spacing to be 
you know, some large spaces in between. For that, we can do the empty collection type. And I can pick whatever I want to represent the bounding boxes for the empty spaces, but you can also pick the exact same collection that you're using to fill the space to, as, to have negative space as well. When I have a one-to-one -one factor, it's going to be 50-50, but you see that this one has the half scale still, and this one has a full scale. So if I change this back to 0.5, and then we should be about 50-50 on the uh, panels being chosen versus the negative space panels. And of course, we can modify the factors in order to play with how, how they are spaced. So I'll set this as 2 to 1. We'll have fewer spaces. 5 to 1, even fewer spaces. And you should get the idea. So quite a bit of flexibility on the spacing there between using the empties and using the margin. Jumping ahead just a little bit because it's convenient when talking about spacing, and we've got this density. So I'm going to remove the empty real quick and pack this again, and we should come up with pretty solid pack. And I'm going to set the density to 0.5. And when I do that, it's only going to try to fill half the space. And depending on which algorithm you're in, it's going to fill it differently. That's what density is for. Now that we've covered all of the basic settings and we've done the quick start, let's talk about how to do a couple of ways of workflow using the save settings feature and the loading settings feature. So let's say you're working on an object and you've picked a few faces and you have them exactly like you want. It took a few settings to get there and you're like, okay, I, I want to keep that. And I don't want to mess with anything after that. I like keep exactly that. And let's, let's either work on the next face or work on the next layer. You're going to hit save. And now when I start packing, and let's say we move on to displays for that same layer, it's going to leave the previous one there. So you can work on that in order to start building up a surface and keep those layers separate because you can hide them individually, which is convenient. Or you can just have them as, as temporary states as you go along. Let's say you, you get your panels, you like it, and you're like, okay, let me go ahead and add another one. And I'll do displays next. We'll set it to a hero. Two of them, that's fine. Now you're at a point where you say, okay, I want to save these, and I'm going to keep going. And you're going to save it. And these are just like temporary checkpoints. You can turn it off and then do other things. And then when you want to come back to it, like if for whatever reason, if we clear this, we can load those settings and resume from where we were at in case you want to try different things. So two different workflow paths that make sense. One is to build up one surface with layers. And the other is to just work on face by face. And of course you could do both, do everything for that face and you can, you know, turn it on and off just to know what's going to go with it. Save, and then we'll go to the next face. Pack it, get, how, get that how we want. Save, go to the next face. You can keep doing this. I recommend working on the these big faces individually. You can select multiple faces, but you might want different results or different settings per you know large face or small faces or whatever having a more control is going to help you uh, instead of just doing everything at once but you have the option of doing that like these edge ones i might want to have smaller scale for instance and uh, rotate things a little bit but if you want to do multiple faces at once, that's fine. If you select the whole object, it's going to try to do the whole object, but you might run into an instance limit, which we've got in the setting. So we've got that those two workflows there, one building up a face and one working face to face. When you have these collections and they represent what you want to keep around, you can also rename them. So we'll go to this, we'll, let's say rename it multi-face and you can see it it changed it here so that when you can turn when you turn it on and off you know what you're working with if you want to ever get those settings back of course you can load the settings if you want to remove that entire set you remove it from here 
not in the outliner. It might get a little confused if you do and you end up with these um, these eyes that have no details next to them. Lastly, in this interface, we have the tools. Some of the tools we've included a few things just to help you in your workflow. We have the check bounding box. So this is going to create a bounding box around your selected object. That will let you know what your object looks like according to the algorithms when it comes to space that it uses. Because it uses a bounding box for every item rather than its actual dimensions. So if you want to use this in order to understand what it looks like according to the algorithm, then that is available to you. You can also use that as a utility to create wireframes and custom margins and child uh, parent relationships. There's a few tips and tricks you can do there, but I recommend using uh, going to the DPAC video to better understand some of those options. Here we have the material swapper. So you can choose any material that's in the scene, choose another material that's in the scene, hit the button in the middle and it will change everything that's in the first, everything that has that first material to that second material. And it'll do according to the scope of what you've chosen here, whether it's the entire scene or just selected objects. We also have a quick button for clean all data here. This is the same as going to file clean up recursive unused data blocks. It just removes all the orphan data. Sometimes that gets left when using this tool for a while. We've got the relationship lines. If you leave this unchecked, it's going to keep those relationship lines off. And if you leave it, if you re-enable it, then you will see those with their child to parent relationships, which seem to get in the way a lot with this tool. It's the same as having the relationship lines here in this checkbox. So now we can talk a little bit of theory on how this works and a few of the uh, inner workings of it just so that you can get the most use out of it. We throw around the term packing a lot and that's because it is bin packing or rectangle packing which is a common problem in computer science in how to take a bunch of rectangles either ordered or unordered and best fit them into a space and you know, decide when that space is completely full and when it needs to go to another one. It does that with the bounding boxes and the dimensions of the face. So we hit pack and that's exactly what it's doing. It's, it's taking these bounding boxes of the objects, deciding how it fits on the face and then instancing those objects to what it, it has decided. And when it does that, we have our temp collection, which gets cleared. So this is this temp collection, the pack underscore temp is what gets cleared when we hit the clear button. And when we hit save, it will rename the pack temp to whatever it decides needs to be the next save name. So save three, that was our pack temp. Now when I hit pack, it's going to create a, a new pack temp and it's going to put the objects there. So understanding how these collections are used in order to organize stuff can be useful. It also creates these special objects I call layout objects or container objects. These are done per face and they have a child of all the instances that are created in that pack. So you could pick this up and move it somewhere else, do what you want with it. Um, it can be useful for rotating and doing different things with that, that layout, or however you need to get creative with that. This wireframe will not render, it's just used as a utility object. That's all I have for now. We've got, we, we've covered a lot of information. If there's anything else that you need to know, we do have docs that we've spent a bunch of time on and you can get to them from this question mark. We have a Discord community we're very active in that you can get to uh, from links in the marketplace and several other places, pretty easy to find. And we are excited to see what you come up with, any questions you have or ideas that you might have about where we go next. All right, I'll see you online, bye.